Welcome to RPM, Rock and Pop Mandolin, your site for learning classic rock and pop songs on this wonderful little eight-stringed instrument. My name is Mike DeJong, and in this video, we should probably change the name of this channel to Rock and Pop and Dog Mandolin, because yes, we have none other than the man and the legend, the dog himself, David Grisman, joining us for an extensive interview. And it's a great interview. David talks about his life growing up, learning to play mandolin, his many influences when he was starting out. He talks about his music and career and the many collaborations he's had. And he tells us what he's doing now with AcousticDisc.com. Really great interview. And if you stay tuned to the end, there's a dog treat for you because David gets out his mandolin and plays some of his more famous tracks for us. And he even shows us some of those really tricky licks near the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. And if you like what you see here, then give us a like, uh, hit that like button down below, and also hit that little subscribe button if you're new to the channel. David Grisman, who I consider the, well, the greatest living mandolin player and probably one of the greatest in history, joins us now on RPM. All right, well, let's start off, David, and uh, just want to say thank you very much for uh, for joining us here on the channel. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have you on. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks for asking me. Well, I know, you know, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of all mandolin players, but uh, I will. I'm just going to say thank you for your years of music and your inspiration to millions of players like me around the world. And also for, you know, showing that the mandolin doesn't have to be pigeonholed into just one type of music. It can cross all genres, right? Uh, that's what I believe, uh, you know, uh, I think that all things are possible. I mean, that's what one thing that inspired me was the fact that there were so many areas that it, it, mandolin really hadn't gone into. So, you know, it kind of gave me stuff to think about and figure out. Cool. Well, let, let's start from the beginning. When did you first pick up this instrument and, and why? Why the mandolin? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I got smitten with bluegrass music when I was, let's see, maybe like 15 years old. And um, there were three of us kind of misfits in, in high school that got interested in folk music. Uh, you know, the Kingston Trio had a big hit. And, and then we uh, got into like Pete Seeger and the Weavers and stuff like that and then one day one one of the three of us had a, an fm radio and he kept telling and there was a a show on there the a folk singer named oscar brand had a weekly show and he had a band on there called the shanty boys which had a scrub style banjo player the roger sprung and uh we kept hearing about this bluegrass music from our friend that had the FM radio. And one day, uh, we lived just outside uh, New York City in a place called Passaic, New Jersey. And uh, you take the bus into Manhattan, and one day, Jack Scott, the, the guy that had the FM radio, came home with an album called Mountain Music Bluegrass Style, produced by Mike Seeger, the Folkways record. And he it he he called the other two of us up. He said, "You got to hear this." Says, and he had already picked out a track to play. It wasn't the first cut on there, but it was "White House Blues" by Earl Taylor and the Stony Mountain Boys. And uh, I got to confess, for all of us, it was the banjo that hooked us in. We all wanted to be banjo players. But Jack, okay. he, <laughs> he he got a banjo before the other the other guys. And then another amazing thing happened. I met a man named Ralph Rensler, who had actually 
um, who was who lived four blocks away, actually. And uh, my mom was an art teacher in Pacific, and she actually was Ralph's art teacher when he was 12 years old. And when I re-encountered him through this interest in folk music, which is another long story, which um, actually, if you go to Acoustic Disc and look up the podcast, podcast number one tells this whole story. So, but Ralph Rinser turned out to be an amazing uh, human being. He was a great mandolin player. He was a member of the first bluegrass band in New York, the Greenbrier Boys. And he also was a folklorist and essentially discovered Doc Watson and, and rediscovered a lot of traditional musicians. And at the end of his life, he was running the Smithsonian Folklife Institute and did a lot of incredible things and was my neighbor and mentor. So that kind of took me from the, you know, the first floor up to the penthouse in terms of being turned on to all kinds of uh, traditional American folk music. All right, and so who were your influences then once you started playing? I would say Bill Monroe would be number one. Well, I mean, Ralph was kind of my guide to this, but uh, uh, I, I discovered a mandolin player named Frank Wayfield. He actually uh, took me under his wing and and, and showed me he kind of opened the door to Bill Monroe for me. But there were four of them, Frank, Bill Monroe, Jesse McReynolds, who pioneered McReynolds style or cross picking, and Bobby Osborne, uh, who had, uh, they were really the original four stylists that had kind of, I mean, Frank kind of took, Bill Monroe's playing to another place, but he was kind of rude. And they were all really rooted in Bill Monroe, although, uh, you know, Frank was the one you could recognize more in his playing. The first time I saw, I mean, Ralph Rensler took me to hear Bill Monroe uh, in 1961. I was 16 years old for the first time, a place called New River Ranch in Rising Sun, Maryland. And, and, and the other opening act band, another bluegrass band, was Frank Wakefield. So from the get-go, I got the mistaken impression that they all sounded like that. <laughs> I saw in an interview you did with Mike Marshall that you, uh, when in your early days, you you learned you know a lot of the Bill Monroe solos by slowing down records, like the way a lot of people do, and a lot of people do with your music, as Mike Marshall pointed out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, back then I had an AR turntable that had four speeds. It had uh, 78, 45, 33, and 16, which is virtually half of 33. So you could slow the record down. And oh, the mandolin, you know, had the advantage of already being really high pitched. So you could kind of hear the notes pretty clear, even though it was playing at half the speed and an octave down and was that worked out and now we do that with your with your music on the computer we can slow it down and oh, try to learn some of your licks i actually write it out now and i have uh you know four books i've got two more in the works uh dog roots that's mostly traditional pieces that i've recorded and then there's dog grass they each have 20 pieces Right. Kind of bluegrass style tunes that I've written and dog jazz, same with jazz, dog Latin. And they all, if you go to acousticdisc.com, you can download a PDF of any one of those 80 tunes. And I've also made a series of what I call audio companions that are generated off the computer off the actual music that I wrote at three different speeds, along with a recording of whatever piece it is. So uh, you get down in there and get the notes somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat is usually what happens for me. But uh, yeah, uh, was Jethro Burns also an early influence of yours? Uh, yeah, he was. I mean, I discovered Jethro uh, on a, uh, Homer and Jethro uh, made a record called Playing It Straight. 
which was a jazz instrumental record. They were, you know, a famous comedy duo. And I remember the cornflakes, Kellogg's cornflakes commercials that they did in the late 50s. But uh, one day, another friend of mine, Steve Arkin, a great banjo player, uh, and I went to Sam Goody's and bought this record. And we went back to Steve's house and put it on the turntable. And inadvertently, that turntable was set for 45 RPM. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the first tune on that record is slow. So we didn't realize it was playing uh, at a faster speed. And then at some point, Jethro starts taking off on some a jazz solo, and it, we just like we're in shock. But then we realize, well, we weren't quite as much in shock when we slowed it down to 33. But yes, uh, I just admired that and, you know, tried, you know, unfortunately, they weren't, they made a second jazz record a couple of years after that, but there wasn't very much I could find on Jethro, but everything I, I could find I had. And in 1973, I was making a cross-country car trip, and I had heard that Jethro uh, was teaching every Tuesday afternoon at a place called Maine Music in uh, Evanston, Illinois. And... Uh, so I called up on a Tuesday afternoon before my trip and got it, found him there and booked a lesson on and planned my trip across the country just so I'd arrive there on a Tuesday afternoon, <laughs> uh, which I did. And I met him and had a great lesson. And he actually, there was a young kid younger than me. I guess I was 28 at the time. Yeah, but there was a, a young teenager waiting for his lesson after me and Jethro asked him if he might you know this guy came from all the way from California uh, <laughs> was that Don Stierenberg waiting for him? I remember, but I didn't know that at the time you know right <laughs> well that's great great story it, I, I, I'm, I'm interested though in your in your in your transition from bluegrass to jazz i mean was um jango reinhardt's music sort of a catalyst in that I as well? Because... that well to be honest with you mike i i never i like i agree with duke ellington who said there's only two kinds of music good and bad right you know? and i always liked what I'm hoping is good music, you know, whether it was Mozart, whether, you know, it was something I heard on the radio or Greek music or, you know, I just got, you know, really passionate about bluegrass, but that didn't mean that I didn't, uh, I, then I started getting, I started listening to jazz. It was like a mystery to me. And, you know, there weren't very many role models in the mandolin. So actually, at one point in 1968, bought a King Super 20 alto sax because I figured to play jazz, you had to play a jazz instrument. <laughs> I had absolutely no, <laughs> no ability, <laughs> no saxophone ability. So uh, I gave that up and went back to trudging along, uh, trying to... I never really did learn how to play jazz per se. I mean, I you know, there's a jazz vocabulary. I mean, it's it's kind of more more open maybe than bluegrass, but all of these styles uh have their own kind of language and uh, I did try to uh study out of some books. Uh I just ended up playing like me. But I did realize that uh, if if you learn any melody, any melody can be played on the mandolin. I, you have a vision for that. You know, it has to transition to be kind of mandolinistic. And, you know, while I was learning to play bluegrass, I was really learning to play the mandolin and how to express myself on it and uh Mostly it was the kind of tone that I was after. Well, that's one thing that a lot of people say about your music is the tone. And in fact, I have a friend here who's a kind of a mandolin mentor. 
His name is Rob Moreau, and he says that you inspired him to play the mandolin mainly because the tone of your of your you know of your mandolin, and um, I think that's that's really a hallmark of, of your sound, isn't it? Well, I think it's a hallmark of. I mean, that's a big part of any musician's sound. I mean, that's what got me. Uh, yeah. Bill Monroe's there's a visceralness to his sound, his tone. And then when I heard Dave Apollon, because when I met Jethro, I asked him who he, who his favorite mandolin player was or who he thought the greatest mandolin player. And he told me Dave Apollon, who I had uh, noticed Dave Apollon's records in the Sam Goodies record bins, but they just, they seemed like, uh, you know, kind of poppy. I, I didn't really hear him, but I could kind of tell. I, it just didn't suck me in to want to hear that for some reason. But once Jethro gave his blessing to Dave Applin, I found every record I could. And the first thing I noticed about him, the first thing that grabbed me about Dave Applin more than his virtuosity was his sound. I think the great musicians, you know, something um, very intangible about tone, you know, they get a certain sound that that's like a voice, you know, it's it's not just, it's them, you know, really through the instrument. Right. Um, I mentioned Django before, and, and you had the great pleasure of uh, playing and recording with Stefan Grappelli, the great violinist and, you know, Django's longtime partner. What, what was that like? That must have been a big thrill for you. An amazing experience, you know, uh, a very challenging uh you know i i never really thought i was worthy but you know he seemed to like it and he liked the bluegrass rhythm and um i just worked well, well actually we first got together because i was hired to write music for a, a movie called king of the gypsies and also i was put in charge of finding musicians to be in the movie and i was going around to like hungarian restaurants <laughs> trying to find gypsy fiddle players and one day the light bulb went off and i thought wow stefan because i had uh, stefan had played in uh san francisco uh a couple of years before that uh, i got the gig and uh so I, I just thought, wow, he'd be perfect for this. And he was, and fortunately, the producer of the film, Federico De Laurentiis, uh, agreed, and they, uh, Stefan was playing in New York, and they hired him. So I'll never forget, my, it was my birthday in 1978, and it, I was destined to be in the record business because that was... I, I w it was 78 and I was born in 45, which made me 33 in 78. And, but so <laughs> I got together with Stefan that day. They hired him he, and to show him the tunes I had written. And that was, of course, big man. You know, he he loved it. And uh, we just hit it off, you know, and, and it was sort of illuminating because you know and ultimately he invited me to uh sit in with him and, and my band and uh and ultimately we were offered a three-week tour where we would be his band and that was an amazing experience and but we had become friends through making this movie you know that music ended up being perfect for him and perfect for the movie. Right. And uh, we got to record it. We got to record it with orchestras, you know. It was just a perfect kind of uh, introduction for us to, you know, me as a composer and a player and Stefan, uh, you know, as, as a, I mean, he really, he wasn't too keen on, you know, doing new things, but he really got into that. Well, that's great. And, uh, you know, I, you, you did a couple, did you do a couple of recordings with him, a couple of albums or? Well, uh, I was right after that, I was making an album called, uh, that became Hot Dog. And I 
asked him if he'd do a session with me for that. And uh, I had this arrangement of minor swing, which I didn't even realize was really different from the original. You'd think, you know, looking back on it, that he would have said, hey, kid, that isn't the way that goes. <laughs> but didn't. You know, I just went with it. Cool. So over the years, I mean, you've 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 played with some great bands, obviously, and some particularly some great guitar players. You mentioned uh, Doc Watson earlier, um, Tony Rice, and Mike Marshall played guitar for you for a while. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorites is Martin Taylor. I love that uh, CD that you did, Best of Friends or something. Or uh, oh, uh, well, that was that's uh, it was originally the CD we did a session. Uh, and recorded a uh, you know bunch of jazz standards, and uh, put out a CD called "I'm Beginning to See the Light," and and then, you know, when the acoustic disc got into uh, downloads, when I realized you could you know sell music without having to press up CDs or LPs and uh, there were a lot of projects which, you know, we couldn't really afford to put out because they didn't sell that well. And, it, you, you know, it's expensive to make a, a CD. But in any case, I put out a second volume of, they were really alternate tracks uh, from those same sessions and uh, called it A Beautiful Friendship, which was the name of one of the tunes. So I think that's what you're you're talking about it never was a CD. It's just a download. Great. An acoustic disc. I mean, I'll put the link down below here uh, right. uh, in this video, but it's still it's still going strong. And there's you yeah. not only loud music on there, but there's music from so many other artists as well. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've tripled. I basically have stopped touring and um, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, kind of shut that down and and uh, yeah. Uh, my wife, Tracy, and I had the opportunity to uh, buy out our partners with Acoustic Disc who they wanted to retire. And uh, we kind of reinvented it into being a digital, you know, basically it was, you couldn't really afford to make CDs anymore. And this, it's a beautiful concept. Like, so I'm trying to produce a new project every month. And it, it's a full-time job because, you know, I became a record producer when I was 18 years old uh, <laughs> when uh, with Red Allen and Frank Wakefield for Folkways, still in print. Uh, and, you know, for 50, 60 years, I kept all the tapes, and that includes live uh, recordings and studio rec I always produced my own records and produced other people's records and uh, have an extensive archive. On top of that, uh, various collectors have given me tapes of things they recorded. And uh, so, you know, we, we recently put out a live concert of Roscoe Holcomb, you know, I think Eric Clapton in, in an interview one time said he was his favorite country musician. Nice. And of course, and Tony, there's Tony Rice on there, the Rice Brothers. Yeah. Um, you know, we got the go ahead to release uh, any live material of Tony's, you know. And uh, yeah, in fact, uh, on the agenda this year, there's a really great. Um, a show at the Grass Valley uh, Bluegrass Festival from 1989 with the essentially the band I had on my first Rounder album, Jerry Douglas, Tony Rice, Vassar Clements, Bill Keith, Mark Schatz, and myself. And uh, it's really well recorded, and uh, everyone was at the top of their game, so... There's... Tell us a bit about your playing with Tony Rice, because to me, you guys seem to have a, a synergy that perhaps yeah. was, was, a, was a pinnacle for you. And, and, you know, just the way that he provided rhythm for you and, and you know, you, I, it's just hard for me to put into words. But you got well, to listen. 
you know, I got to play with Clarence White uh, when I was 19. I, uh, Roland White hired me to, uh, he his wife was having a baby, and he hired me to play with uh, the Kentucky Colonels for a week at the Gaslight Cafe in Greenwich Village. And they all stayed at my fifth floor walk-up DC current bathtub in the kitchen apartment. And uh, we, after playing two sets every night, we'd come home and jam all night long, just me and Clarence. Right. And uh, he had a certain thing on the guitar uh, that I never heard anybody else do. And of course he was tragically killed in 1973 and I, Never thought I'd heard I would hear that again mm -hmm. uh, until the day I met Tony Rice sitting on a living room floor in Washington, D.C. And we played a tune together. And I said, My, I said to myself, Clarence is back. Because wow. Tony had that same thing, but he kind of had a bigger sound. Um, but yeah, I mean, he. I've been blessed <laughs> to play with some of the great, you know, uh, acoustic musicians. And, you know, it's uh, uh, unfortunately, very many of them are no longer around. And one, another one would be Jerry Garcia. And that's the one that uh, um, I, I really love that one, too. You're, I you're just, I've been editing our next podcast, which is on the pizza tapes. Oh, so awesome. I just re recorded two hours of me talking about the pizza tapes and and putting those guys together. I mean, that was done while we were making tone poems, Tony and I. And I invited and, and Jerry, I think they had met one time at a recording studio and never played together. And I I invited Jerry to come on over, and it was just a room full of guitars and mandolins and and we were all set up to record. And so I, I said, hey, you want to record? Want to play some stuff? And we just got into it for two consecutive nights. And it was a real treat for me to hear the two of those guys together, you know, because they're so different. Right. We all had a great time with that. And, uh, yeah, Jerry, I think every great musician has got their own uniqueness. and. Uh, I think, you know, when you play, I mean, Stefan used to say, if he if he's playing good, the credit belongs to who's what's behind him. And I agree with that. I mean, you know, to to play your best, I mean, you can have all your experience, all your chops, but that je ne sais quoi missing ingredient is inspiration. You know, and uh, I drew a lot of inspiration from all these people, and hopefully they got a bit from me. Uh, you know, when you play the supportive role, it, that's a really important thing, even more important than you know if you're playing a solo or I mean, or a certainly equally important. Right. I mean, that, you really have to listen to what's happening and and try to just play the right thing and support that without going overboard. It's uh, dynamics. You know, that's the thing I love about acoustic m music. I never could quite get past the um, electric thing of you're playing something here and it's coming out of a box somewhere else, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, with an acoustic instrument, you can get really quiet, you know, just I can get, I learned how to work a mic, you know, how far to be, and then and move that, you know, move away from it sometimes. And, you know, if you're going to be playing heavy rhythm, you want to back off a little. All those things. It just, hey, you just learn by essentially screwing up. <laughs> hey, I mean, you learn as much, you know, probably more from all the mistakes you make. Right, exactly. And I was intrigued to read that, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm going to ask you that you actually met Jerry at a baseball game in the first place, right? No, I met him at a Bill Monroe show. 
Okay. Uh, uh, but the baseball game was, I had been, I was out in the San Francisco area and I had just finished a gig with the earth opera band in Southern California. I came up to visit a friend and heard that there was a softball game between the uh, Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane in Fairfax, California. So we went there, and, Jerry, and of course Jerry was there. And that, and he, because uh, I didn't have his number at the time, I I wasn't. But we we knew each other, and and uh, had spent time together on both coasts. And uh, he asked me if I, you know, he said, "Hey, we're making a record. Can you play a couple of tunes on it?" So I stayed a couple of days later. Uh, later, and that ended up being American Beauty. One of the but, landmark oh, albums from the great Dead. And the tracks that you played on are, are, are classics, Ripple. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was in Starbucks one year, and they had a, you know, they used to put out uh, the CDs and on the Starbucks layover, they, you know, to sell in their stores. And they had a Grateful Dead compilation, two <laughs> CD set. And I had the first cut on side one and the last cut on side two. <laughs> also got them their first national press in 19, before they were the Grateful Dead, they were called the Warlocks. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, I was working for Israel G. Young, who was the proprietor of the Folklore Center, which was in Greenwich Village, which was kind of a mecca for folk. And, and he uh, he had a monthly column in Sing Out magazine called Frets and Frails. And it, if you go back to like September or October 1965, in his column, he says, Dave Grisman just came back from the West Coast and he discovered this band that combines bluegrass and rock and roll called the Warlocks. You know, the one thing that people maybe you don't realize about Jerry Garcia, unless you're a big follower, a big fan, is his bluegrass influence. I mean, people look at him as, you know, folk rock or whatever, but really he was a bluegrasser too. Wasn't yeah, he? well, that's where we met at a uh, Bill Monroe show. And uh, yeah, Jerry was a fine banjo player. And of course we had Olden in the Way, which we just re released a, a great show, live recording uh, from... Uh, Sonoma State in Katati, California. We released it on the very 50th anniversary of that gig on that very day in this past November. All right, cool. Yeah. You know, I wanted to kind of delve into your style of playing a little bit for my, my viewers here. You know, a lot of the viewers to this channel maybe are new to mandolin or they're coming over to mandolin from guitar, playing guitar, which is what I did about five or six years ago. So learning this instrument, you know, is a bit of a challenge at first, but taking it to that next level where you're soloing, I mean, that's you know, a higher level as well. What kind of advice would you give to people? I mean, you just, you gave a little bit of advice earlier about accompaniment, but what about people who want to get into improvisation and solo? Well, the way I look at it is, um... What a lot of people think uh, improvisation is, I don't, I think they're over making it a little more complicated uh, than it need be. It's just, a, music is a language now. Uh, we're having this conversation in English. We both grew up learning to speak English, studied in school, speak every day to other English speaking people. And it's our language, you know, you could say this is improvising. This is improvising, but it's really composition. Now, uh, because we're making this up, but it's the words, we've said these words before. We've combined these phrases before, maybe not precisely this way but I mean this is the reason if you hear Charlie Parker you can tell it's Charlie Parker as opposed to Earl Scruggs and if you get really into it you can tell Earl Scruggs from Ralph Stanley and Ralph Stanley from J.D. Crow uh, but in terms of improvising I just think you have to 
for stuff to come out, you have to take it in. So learn as ma many melodies as you can. Just learn what interests you, you know. Uh, All right, at this point in the video, David wanted to play some songs for us, but we were having a little bit of trouble hearing his mandolin with our Zoom settings. So he went and got another computer, and we, we tweaked the settings and finally got it to work, and now we can hear his mandolin. It looks a little bit different, not quite as nice as the other picture we had earlier, but at least we can hear him playing, and playing he does later in this video after he continues talking about how to solo and improvise on the eight strings. So let's continue with that. As I mentioned, you keep trying to absorb information, tunes, licks, I did a lot of transcribing. I spent a year and a half writing a book that never got published, but in the process, I transcribed Bill Monroe, Jesse McReynolds, Bobby Osborne, Frank Wakefield, uh, and learned, you know, was trying to emulate their, their whole thing. You know, it's just more than the notes. It's, you know, the attack, the, and I was fortunate you know, uh, you can learn the notes to anything, but these different styles like bluegrass, I think the only way to really learn those styles is to play with masters of, <laughs> or really good players in that style. Fortunately, I got to play with the Kentucky Colonels and Red Allen early on. They hired me and uh, I just paid attention, you know, and tried to fit in. And, uh, you know, through the process of learning these tunes and licks, you stumble on things you want to retain and, and copy and use. And, uh, and then you discover things. I've written a lot of tunes, but, but I wouldn't worry about improvising and, uh, you know, doing your own thing, you could call it learn how somebody else did it you know and really pay attention to the details you know there's a great salvador dali museum in saint petersburg florida that's just one big room and it's uh, all the dali paintings are in chronological order and you can see for the first eight or ten years he's copying other painters and finally, Dolly starts to emerge. So, you know, at first, uh, you know, I just, I got into like, I want to learn everything Bill Monroe ever played and sound just like him. <laughs> and as I got closer to being able to achieve that goal, it, it, it seemed pointless to me because Bill Monroe was out there being Bill Monroe. Fortunately, this other thing kicked in at some point, which was me. But you don't, you know, don't rush on, on trying to be original. Just study what you, what you want to sound like, and learn how somebody else did it. And through that process, and keep learning tunes. You know, there's so much available to a musician now. Then I mean, I had to. I spent years trying to find a particular Dave Apollon album or you know uh, right. but you have to search it out and then uh, spend a lot of time there, there's no there's no shortcut you know uh, it, 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 practice makes perfect as they say you know now i don't play as much as i should string oh, like, play the e on the on the d string after that b flat yeah so you're playing the eighth fret and then you're playing the second fret on the same string right nice stretch i made that up for a movie called eat my dust that's where you get eat my uh, emd Right. I didn't want to plug the movie too much, but it was a hot, high school hot rod chase movie, and it just wanted fast stuff. So uh, I, you know. So 
those are all like upstrokes. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I don't think of in terms of modes or scale. You know, I just, I'm searching for the right note at the right time. That's one of my all-time favorite dog tunes, I, I got to say, too. Cool. Yeah, I know. It. I, I hardly ever play, you know, I played it so much for years. I mostly, you know, I write, I keep writing songs, so I, I, I basically write and uh, working on my latest stuff. That's what I play the most, you know. There's a slower version of EMD that I heard on one of your your tracks on one of the albums. Oh on, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, on uh, DGK Twenty. Yeah. Or it's it's a, uh, an extra cut on Dog Ninety. Or yeah. I did it with John Sebastian too. Right. <laughs> It's the same, you can play, and I, you know, you can do it lots of different ways. For years, I would just have my band, they go out one by one, starting with the bass, and he'd just start playing E minor to C7. And then the percussion would come out, and he'd start playing percussion on the bass, and then he'd move over, and then the uh, guitar player would come out and start playing chords. It's all like a vamp, and then the flute player would come out, and he'd start soloing. Then they'd introduce me, and I'd go into this song, you know, right? And yeah. then speed it up. If you got a good tune, you, you can do it any old way. You could, you could do it fast. You can do it slow. You could do it Latin. You could do it swing. But you have to be conversant with those styles. And that's the beauty of dog music. It crosses so many different styles and so many different genres, right? Sorry, I was going to say another one of my favorite songs from you is Tipsy Gypsy. And again, you know, you're yeah. hitting, just like with EMD there, you're hitting that flat five. And it's, again, you know, sort of a minor well, that's got every. That has every wrong note in it. It goes... screwed it up a little bit no, but, you know a... i'm not up on the, these older tunes i mean i i wrote that probably before you were born <laughs> 1978 it's... how how many years ago is that there's Boys. a great version uh, that you do with uh, uh to is it tommy emmanuel uh, oh yeah yeah you can find on the internet that's really cool was, was that recorded in in your house or... yeah yeah right right over there <laughs> in the living room we're in the library right now i really thank you so much for joining us today well, and uh, thank you michael you know uh good luck with uh, all your endeavors and spread the mandolin word
that's what we're trying to do on the channel. We're trying to get out to new people and get some new players and turn them on to legends such as yourself so they can check out your music and, uh, you know, your, your career. Well, I appreciate that. You can find it all at AcousticDisc.com, or most of it. Hey, good luck with, with what you're doing, and uh, you sound pretty good on that thing. Was the man, the legend, the dog, David Grisman, joining us here on RPM. Thanks very much to David for taking time out to talk to us. He's really a nice guy and a great person to talk to, great person to interview. What a great knowledge for dates and names and all of the uh, people that he's met over his career. So I hope you enjoyed that interview. If you did, hit that little like button down below. And if you're new here, hit that little subscriber button down there on the lower right corner of the screen. That helps this channel to continue to grow and helps us to continue to bring you interviews with legendary mandolin players and much more in the future. Thanks for watching RPM.